most important things you can do on this earth is to let people know they are not alone. And with that, I will introduce my guest for this week, our guest for this week, Josh Nass, known also as Hosh Nazi and KI6NAZ and Ham Radio Crash Course YouTube channel. Josh, welcome to The Switch. Thank you very much for having me out. So before we get into all things uh, amateur radio, at least that we can hit, um, I want to start by rolling it back and getting into a little bit of your story. Tell us uh, sort of if you could divide your life into epochs, you know, where I started, where I was then, where I am now. Give us as much of that story as you'd like to tell. Uh, sure. So I, God, I wish it was a, a really fun and interesting story, but uh, I'm born and raised in California, Southern California, lived here pretty much my whole life in, uh, outside of LA. I grew up in a town called Whittier. Now I live in a town called Cerritos, about nine miles down the street or so. I would say growing up, uh, I kind of lived with just learning things and kind of understanding how things worked on paper. But for a long time, and it, it feels like until I got out of college, really, that I didn't uh, feel like I could fail, uh, that I had to learn a lot before actually trying to apply it into something, make something, and start being more confident in my abilities to, to create, if you will. I was a Boy Scout, um, so I learned a lot of outdoor skills and self-reliance things. I ended up becoming an engineer through college and a trade. I've worked for aerospace companies. I'm a, I'm a software developer now. Uh, but I found that as I've gotten older, I feel like either I got more confident or I got less fearful of just trying things and failing. And as I failed more, I learned more. And that seems to have kind of skyrocketed my growth and somewhat confidence in kind of where I'm at today and um, how kind of I do things on my YouTube channel and whatnot. Nice. So how, how did you get into the amateur radio world, the ham world? Back in 2000, around 2006, 2007, I was working for uh, Boeing at the time. I, don't, I no longer work for them, but I was uh, working on a satellite ground station, so a lot of RF involvement. And my uh, what would become my Elmer, which is kind of ham radio lingo for a mentor, said, "Hey, you know, you you kind of you got an interest in in both the software that goes into some of this stuff, but a lot of the electronics components." you should take a look at amateur radio. And until that point, I had experienced it. When I was in Boy Scouts, there was a scoutmaster that had their license. And I remember uh, a summer camp one year and he had this radio, you know, and you know what you're thinking in your head, a, a handy talky type device. And we were all around our tents and he's talking and I don't know what he's talking to. I didn't, I didn't understand at the time. And he was trying to relate to us, oh, I'm, I'm talking to a repeater. And again, maybe in Lost in Translation or how he tried to explain it, I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand what he was doing. All I knew is that he was, he seemed to be relatively interested in it and having fun with it. Years later, it wasn't until I kind of met this other engineer who, who became my mentor where I said, oh, okay, I, I get it now. I kind of understand what this is all about. And then that led me to basically go to a store in Anaheim that's called the Ham Radio Outlet. They're all over the country, by the way. And I met another individual named Bob, and he kind of walked me through some of the radios, uh, got me a book to study, to answer the questions, to then get or apply to take the test to get my amateur radio license, which is an FCC granted license. Nice. And then, so how long was it before you started the YouTube channel from them? Like, what's the story between getting your first radio and deciding I'm going to talk about this stuff on YouTube? Uh, that's a really interesting one. It's kind of a longer story, but I, I'll, try, I'll try to keep it short. I mean, take your time. Sure. Yeah. In, in 2006, my, my wife basically told me, you know, you've got too many hobbies uh, at the time we were, we were dating. And, you know, you, you kind of like talking to people about things you're passionate about. Why don't you check out this crazy thing called YouTube? And I did. And so in 2006, I, I created a YouTube channel. And at the time, it had nothing to do with amateur radio, because really, I was still kind of introducing myself to amateur radio, still kind of learning, right, if you will. And so it, it was on things like hiking and gold prospecting. And, you know, every once in a while, I'd splash in a cigar review back when 
when everybody was going to the cigar, you know, bars down the street. And that was 2006. And my YouTube has kind of been alive ever since then. And it was uh, largely just a pursuit of whatever hobby I was into. For anybody that knows anything about YouTube, that's a sure shot sign that your, your uh, channel really won't take off because it's just too, too many avenues of interest, too many things that, that people can't really latch onto and, and find something interesting and want to subscribe and, and follow you. What ended up changing things a bit was um, in 2015, I challenged myself to start doing daily videos. And so I would produce, you know, a, a 10 minute or 20 minute video a day. And I ended up doing that for over 600 days. And I learned a lot at that time. Uh, really what that helped me do was kind of refine my process for how I make videos. And I'm not pretending to be a, a filmmaker or anything like that, but just how I could efficiently convey my thoughts through the medium of video, right? And after kind of learning a process and kind of what I was interested in, and after experiencing kind of 600 days of trying to make content, I started to gravitate toward the things in my life that I found most interesting. And the one thing that I just kept going back to and back to and had more fun with it was amateur radio. And that led me down the road of, of kind of thinking about it and wanting to convey my love of amateur radio to as, as many people as possible. And the best way I thought to do that was, why don't I explain to people how to get their license? In the United States, uh, which differs country to country, but in the United States, we have three licensing systems. We have the technician, the general, and the amateur extra. And so I started out, just endeavored to walk people through the study guides that exist, uh, taking practice tests to get your technician license. And somewhere along the way, people kind of got really engaged in it, and they really liked the, the weekly kind of show format where I would walk people through amateur radio and kind of this visual setting because it allowed me to do things like, you know, demonstrate radios, kind of explain why using visual aids, things work the way they work. And that led to then going on and making a, a course on the general class license for helping people get to that level. And then just lots of video reviews of radios, fun aspects of the, the different technical aspects to radio because we'll talk about it, but radio is an incredibly large hobby with a ton of diversity. And really just week by week, I produce a live stream video and then what I call a short form video, which is anywhere between 10 minutes to 20 minutes. And I have, I, I, there's really no end to the number, the content that I can produce just because of how diverse the hobby is. So kind of they, I eventually got all the way back around to amateur radio, but it took me a little while. I've, I've been on YouTube for over 10 years now, actually, you know, almost 15 years. So it's been fun. Yeah. And so I want to highlight one of the principles that you actually basically said twice in two different ways that when you started to experience, uh, started to have less fear of failure, you started to output more and your growth skyrocketed. Can you sort of talk about like, what, what was it that made you realize if I'm just less fearful of failure, if I'm just putting stuff out there, I, I can grow, or at least I'll get something different than I was getting before. There, there's a couple of things. I'll, I'll give you the, the easy one, I think, first. One of the things that started to change my, do this paradigm shift was I bought a home and I just had to like do a lot of work around the house. So I had to go research how to do it. And you know, my dad wasn't around all the time. He was an extremely skilled handyman and, and mechanic. But I just realized, hey, I can do this. And I thought to myself, hey, tools are cheaper to buy than it is to hire somebody to do it for me. So I'll just start going down that path. And, and once I started doing that, not to say that that's completely adjacent with amateur radio, I started to learn like, hey, um, no, I can do this. And, and yeah, there's, there's not just people that I can talk to, but the internet kind of changed everything. I found a lot of answers to my problems just from doing Google searches or, you know, whatever, finding websites I liked and kind of diving in a bit deeper. As far as how that changed with YouTube, obviously I started carrying that confidence over. And I realized at a certain point that for a lot of things, um, you know, what do, what do they say? The, the enemy of good is great. 
now, of course, you want to produce the best content possible. You want to make really good content. But at the same time, I, I completely acknowledge the fact that, you know, I still have a career unrelated to YouTube and a family that, you know, demands a certain aspect of my time. So at a certain point, I just tell myself, hey, uh, this is probably as good as it's going to get. If it needs to be revisited, you know, we can come back to that. I can come back to that. And so I've, I've kind of learned that with a lot of things, it's, it's more of a, a marathon than a sprint. And so I take my time where I can to produce the best content I can, but at the same time, not producing it is worse than just putting something out there and say, hey, I, I did the best I could given the resources and time I have at this moment. Was there any specific failure that you had that kind of changed your mind about that, that you were kind of hyping up in your mind and then once it happened, you realized, oh, it's not so bad? As, as far as the YouTube side goes, um, and I had a bit of fear in doing the live streams. I, I really thought that being able to talk, largely just me, although I do interview people from time to time, that I would kind of like run out of ideas. And at some point you kind of get into what I call little mini ruts. But a lot of that time really just meant that, you know, I could reach out to this community that exists that kind of, that, that somewhat I created and, and get ideas, get feedback from them. And that ended up bolstering me more than anything was just, you know, if any time I feel like I'm not completely in love with the topic that I'm planning or thinking about planning, I just reach out to the community and say, hey, what, do you, what would you like me to talk about? What would you like to see? And that oftentimes, you know, fulfill my, my calendar for a full month or more. So often whenever I feel like I've reached the kind of end of, of what I am I'm thinking about or what I'm planning, I just reach out to people and say, hey, what do you think? Yeah, makes sense. I mean, that, that's similar to like a lot of marketing strategies of like, you know, you from a meeting, you uh, sort of book a meeting. It's, it's reaching out to the other um, people in your network and not just trying to self-generate. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. The, the mindset uh, that you mentioned as well of like, I can learn to do these things myself, like from the house to the YouTube videos, that reminds me a lot of what Shrikant said a couple of weeks ago when we interviewed him about uh, his sort of intellectual journey. I know before the show, we were marveling at his bookshelf and he basically said like, at some point he figured out that he could learn himself. He could do the process of learning and understanding the world by going out into it and doing things. So cool. Okay. So, uh, now that we've, uh, we've gotten a couple of those interesting principles in there, I, I want to catch everybody up with what is ham radio? Like people, if they're not familiar, probably keep hearing this term and have no idea what we're talking about. Everyone's heard of radio. What is amateur radio? And give us that in comparison to like what people might be familiar with. Yeah, so if you branch out from like your, ta your, your touch points that you know, right, you get in your car, you, you may use your radio, but everybody listens to podcasts now on their phone. But that thing that's on the dashboard, right, you turn that on and, and it's using the antenna that's in your car, that's receiving a signal, right? You're receiving a broadcast station. And there's a, there's a ton of different aspects to that, what frequencies they're on and whatnot. Uh, amateur radio kind of takes that model and adds the transmit capability. So with your FCC license, you're able to transmit. Um, everybody's able to receive. Anybody can go buy a ham radio to receive on, but it takes a license to be able to transmit. So with that license, we are allowed privileges on which frequencies we can transmit. I mentioned the three different classes of license earlier, technician, general, and extra. As you kind of climb the ranks, you get access to more frequency space, more areas that you can kind of put your radio on and, and transmit. So you kind of get the idea where I'm going with this is it's two-way communication. From one side of the town to maybe the other side of the world, well, we can use our radios to communicate. I like to say it is self-supported communication. That seems to be a good way to explain to people. Everything that I use to communicate with someone else is solely under my control. Powering my station, the antenna I use to transmit and the radio I purchase or I build nor I acquire in some way. And the other person I'm talking to is doing the same thing. 
we don't rely on really a, a service provider or a backbone. We just go, you know, source to source, A to B. And that's a, a good way of looking at it. And it's done wirelessly. So it's all using radio frequencies to, to achieve that. Uh, how would that... that, but keep, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how would that be different than say your hardware store to a FRS radio? Great question. So FRS radios and what's called GMRS, so family radio service, those are like blister pack radios that you can purchase. And those radios are what they call type accepted by the FCC. The FCC says these radios, they'll have you know nine to 20 channels, they're channelized radios. They can only transmit on those channels. They have to meet the FCC standards for how much power they put out, what type of antenna they use, various other things. But at the end of the day, you know, just with the people in this room, um, we would almost fill up all those channels of just two people wanting to just talk to each other, right? Well, all of a sudden you'd get in this situation where you've got multiple radios on the same channel and they're cross-talking with each other and it gets really complicated. Again, going back to amateur radio, that is a frequency-based system. The, the operator is licensed so they follow the principles and the safety guidelines of using radio on a very widespread space of frequencies. And we can have walkie-talkie type conversations like with FRS radios, or we can have larger antennas like something in your backyard that would allow you to talk across the country, across the state, you know, a world really, depending on what you want to apply. So it's, it's really a given set of frequencies that the FCC allows us to operate on for whatever particular communication demands we have at that time. So what's, what are the reasons to get involved in amateur radio? Like why would somebody decide to go through the licensing requirements, go through and take the test and study and maybe even upgrade to the various levels? What's, what's the point of that? There's a lot of really good reasons. I'll, I'll try and cover a couple of them. A lot of people, particularly today, are finding amateur radio through kind of personal preparedness aspects. Again, going back to what I mentioned about, you know, cell phones, right? Cell phones, I mean, we just had a major denial of service attack that happened today. Uh, cell phones kind of stopped working. You weren't able to call people. Radio will never do that to you, right? You'll always be able to pick up your radio as long as it's in working order, and you'll be able to communicate with generally whoever you're trying to communicate with, although you'll be able to find someone. So people have started carrying them just for that aspect, not to mention people that go outdoors, maybe to areas where cell phones just will never reach, and that is always a good second kind of line of defense. Another aspect is that people just really seem to enjoy the hobby aspect of it. A lot of the times radios are something where we're building the antenna or we'll bu we're building some part of the radio that we then can put up on the air, going back to kind of what I said earlier of like making something, doing something on your own. Uh, that's pretty much all amateur radio is, is that, yeah, you can go by like a turnkey radio station, but a lot of people get deep enjoyment, myself included, from getting your hands dirty and actually working on your radio, building your antenna and, and going into that whole thing. Plus there's just a, a massive community aspect to it. The, the ability to, to reach out under your own power basically and talk to someone in another country and have a discussion with them and, and basically create you know a, a network, if you will, this community on the air is really interesting to a lot of people. Um, even in today's day and age, it's, it's fascinating how many more people were getting into amateur radio when they start to understand like what you're capable of doing with it and the fun you can have. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get into why I got into it earlier. You actually mentioned it. Um, I wanna make sure we don't skip one of the questions that I was super interested in asking you, which is what is it like the first time talking on a ham radio and I've heard this term mic fright. Uh, I just got my license a week ago and I have st st still yet to push the talk button. Uh, what, what, what happens? What is that like? And what was it like for you? Yeah, it was, it was scary the first time for sure. Uh, I feel like I'm kind of a, I talk too much as it is. So I, I don't have a problem clicking a button before I do it, but most people experience mic fright. 
and particularly what's what's going on there is people worry too much about what they're about to say there there's really only a couple of things you have to worry about when you have a conversation on amateur radio is that you use your call sign when you're starting the conversation you use your call sign every 10 minutes after that point and then you use your call sign when you wrap up the conversation after that point it's just a matter of being like there's a certain level of niceties that we try to uh, maintain in amateur radio there are exceptions there's bad apples of course in, in every hobby but that's kind of the big thing the piece of advice i give everyone when they experience mic fright is listen listen a lot generally i listen probably 80 percent of the time than transmitting I'm always trying to listen so I understand kind of how the flow of the conversation is going on. For technicians, for people starting out with the technician license, you're generally going to be probably talking on what's called a repeater. I kind of mentioned that when I mentioned the Boy Scouts before. A repeater is kind of like a, a radio that's on a, a building, tall building, or a hilltop. What the repeater is doing is when you key up that radio and you talk into it, it is taking your signal it's turning it into a different frequency and then kind of transmitting over a much broader area. So you with your handy talkie hit a repeater, it kind of amplifies it with more power and then transmits over a much larger space. So a repeater almost becomes like a community party line. There are tons of people that listen to repeaters and since you can't see these people, since you, you know they're out there, you don't know who's out there and you think about keying up and you're like, oh man, am I going to screw up? Am I going to make a mistake? Uh, the reality is, is that even really experienced people make mistakes. Uh, we do it all the time. And amateur radio is such that we're generally not that hard on each other. We are amateurs, meaning it's not, it's not professional, that we try and kind of maintain a certain level of niceties, but generally we're all kind of trying to learn more together and, and increase our knowledge of radio. So just try and have fun with it, except, expect that you will make mistakes. Often you'll find that the repeaters, particularly the good ones, have a really nice community of people that if you say, hey, I'm new, um, oh man, they'll open the doors for you, be extremely welcoming and, and help you through the whole process. So what does the day in the life of somebody who's using ham radio look like? Like what, who are these people you're talking to? What are the conversations that you have? And are people doing like radio shows there? Is it a communication only? It can be a myriad of things. I will focus on the, what most people will experience when they're starting out. Again, you've got, you probably have a handy talkie that you're talking on, or they do. They maybe have a radio in their car. Um, I know I have a couple radios in my car. And so I get in my car and, you know, instead of turning on the radio or listening to a podcast, I will get on the amateur radio. I'll be able to hit the repeaters that are around me. We've got a, a breakfast net, as we call it, on one of the repeaters. And that's just really people talking about what's going on in their day. Um, aspects of their life they're going through, hobbies that they're interested in. There's a lot of people talking about electric bicycles right now. Everybody's buying electric bicycles for uh, getting some exercise or helping them along as they're, as they're trying to get some exercise. So it's, it's really just kind of like, we call it the original social network. That's kind of what it is. is it's, a, it's a party line where friends who weren't necessarily friends when they started out are now talking to each other and there's kind of a daily rapport now, that's the, the repeater side. That's the local side. We call that very high-frequency VHF and ultra-high-frequency radio signals. That's line-of-sight communication, meaning that at a certain point, that, that signal kind of starts to hit the curve of the earth, and it, it doesn't bend. The same thing goes on with HF, shortwave radio. The difference there is that we're using a bit bigger radios, bigger antennas, and, and our signals are kind of bouncing off the ionosphere and coming back down. Well, the advantage of that is that now, instead of it just being your local community, you're talking to people across the country. And there are nets that exist every day. Same kind of idea. You know, they'll start up in the morning. I have one that starts at like 7 a.m. my time, kind of drive time. And they're all over the country. And we get together on what's called 40 meters, which is a band. About 7.155 megahertz is where the, um, this net meets. And they just kind of talk about what's going on in their day. Usually ham radio talk, like the radio guys like to talk about radios. So we talk a lot about radios. <laughs> could, could, do you think you guys could give 
us a little like rundown, like talk to each other as you would on a radio. I'm just, I'm curious to hear like what these kind of formalities or um, rules are. Okay. Oh, you mean do like a, like a mock radio contact over Zoom? Yeah. I've got a prop. Hold on. (laughs) (laughs) I'll hold up my radio. You've got a radio. Do my best. Um, See, uh, so part of the, Part of the Go problem ahead. is I also, th- this is, even though it's a mock contact, it'll still be my first contact where I'm talking. So it, you may have to walk me through some steps. Yeah. Well, we're going to pretend this is on a repeater first and this may be, we, we, can, Perfect. we can do a couple of these, but uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pulling out my radio. Maybe I'm driving in my car. I'm going to say uh, KD2 TZU. This is Kilo India 6 November Alpha Zulu. Are you monitoring? And I would say KD2TZU, uh, I hear you, KI6NAZ. Yeah, pretty much. And, and then the conversation would start at that. Okay. Or if, if I wasn't trying to call him, I could say something as simple as, this is Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. I am doing a radio check, just making sure my radio can hit the repeater. How am I sounding? What's my signal report? Good. KD2TZU. <laughs> Yeah, it could be as simple as that. Uh, now, if we're talking for a while, going back to what I was saying, is this is an FCC license, much like when you turn on the AM or FM broadcast and they give their call sign. Well, it's a similar call sign setup. You know, we said two characters, a number, and then three letters. That's my FCC call sign granted to me. And, and Chase has his own, right? And so we would every, every 10 minutes or so, right? No more than 10 minutes, you say, you know, KI6NEZ, you know, back to you. And then the conversation would keep going. And then as we would wrap up the conversation, it would be something along the lines of KD2, TZU, great talk we had today. I'll say seven threes. This is Kilo India 6, November Alpha Zulu. And 73 is kind of the universal best wishes kind of term that we throw out in amateur radio. Very cool. Yeah. Um, is, do you think part of the appeal is kind of getting into this new realm where there's a new set of rules and it's almost like being a, a beginner all over again and being able to really feel yourself learning and growing and becoming competent. I love that you asked that because the entire hobby is that over and over and over and over again. So we just talked about handy talkies, right? This is just one step. You can become skilled in using these. And then there's the next step in well, maybe now you're going to use an in-car radio, so you have to learn that. But then when you decide to go to HF, high frequency, uh, big antennas, the, the one that reaches across the country, that's almost a whole new paradigm. And that's just talking voice. All we did was talk, talk about voice right now. Um, I'm very active in data communication where, our, where my computer connects to my radio and I transmit uh, text images, uh, whatever, and it's across the world uh, with that capability. That's one of my big, big passions in the hobby. And that's its own, you know, first step, then you get to the top and then you look around and say, okay, where can I go with this? And then you're, you're always doing that because the hobby is so massively broad and, and diverse. Yeah, that's do, awesome. Do you see sort of a, I mean, and maybe the, the licensing requirement um, sort of filters this kind of attitude out, but like what what you were just saying reminds me of like in martial arts they talk about um like white beltism or white belt syndrome of like you get to be a white belt in something again uh where you're you're diving in you're learning new stuff it all seems foreign to you there's just stuff to absorb um but in martial arts like especially in something like brazilian jiu-jitsu white belts there are basically two attitudes right there's the people who come in they realize like they have that awakening that that world is there and they're open books. They're there to absorb everything. And then there are other people who feel crushed by it and are sort of driven out. It, do you see that much? And how do you sort of deal with that as a community? There's a couple of things I'll answer to that one. Generally, I find that there really are kind of two people in amateur radio as well. There's more than that, but let's talk about the two. Instead of the kind that just kind of get crushed by it, I find that there's people who kind of find the thing that they really like, and then that's just what they do. They just become the black belt of that particular aspect, which is great. You know, that's that's more people to talk to. Then there are other people that's kind of more like me that uh, as I find new things, new 
technology that we have kind of grafted on amateur radio that I get really interested in that. And I kind of go chase that down and I kind of jump around a lot as my interests in it change and, and, you know, whatever over time evolve going to kind of what you said about the, the tiered system. If you think about that as, as belt, the black belt in amateur radio, I, I like that. Uh, I am an, an amateur extra, so I guess I'm a black belt, but that system is built on uh, privileges that you get access to. So when you're starting out, you generally have access to kind of what I mentioned, the VHF, UHF line of sight communication. That's your first level. Your, your sphere of influence, if you will, is kind of limited to that line of sight bubble of transmission capability that you have from your radio. When you get your general, which is kind of probably the big, the big step, when you get to that level, that's where literally kind of the world opens up because then you're able to really get on the HF frequencies and kind of really experience what amateur radio is, is really about or what its legacy was and, and kind of still is growing today. So I want to talk about preparedness and uh, emergency comms. That's the big thing that got me into amateur radio and uh, the way I actually discovered your YouTube channel was through the Fieldcraft uh, collab that you did with Mike Glover. Uh, we have him scheduled for next week actually and uh, so let's just assume actually if you want to go over any like sort of preparedness principle foundational stuff that, that applies feel free. Uh, I don't by no means am I limiting you from talking about that but we are sort of having the conversation out of order because I'm going to be asking him all about, you know, things like why does it matter to be prepared for these various things? Like what kind of mindset is this? Things like that. So if you want, let's just assume that we've already had that conversation. We've, you know, sort of gotten some of the foundation from uh, sort of the principles of preparedness. And then let's, let's talk emergency communications. Like how does ham radio fit into sort of an overall strategy of preparedness? It, it's kind of like the mother of all emergency communications that are, that are accessible by civilians pretty much. You know, to me, it is, it is one layer of, of preparedness. It's a very large layer of communications preparedness, but it, it allows you to do so many things with it. It allows you to, kind of what we already said, right? I can, I can work with local people on the ground with their radios. I can talk to them directly. You know, I, I gave an example. I did a video, a, like a three or four part series on emergency communications. And in the, in the second video, I mentioned that I'm a member of CERT. Uh, what is that? Community Emergency uh, CERT. Community Emergency <laughs> Response Team. Response Team. Thank you. Yep. And as a part of that team and, and working with those people, there's an easy situation when you're canvassing a neighborhood after an emergency where you probably can just hand a radio to someone if they have the skill in it, hopefully they would be a radio amateur, that we could relay information very quickly back and forth to wherever your base station is. And that base station could have an appreciable antenna with enough power output that you could then contact emergency services. And there are amateurs that kind of embed themselves with the sheriffs, uh, with local hospitals. There are emergency teams that are based around amateurs that we can interoperate with when power's out, cell phones are gone, internet's gone. All of that is kind of like where amateur radio shines. And then that's why it gets, it gets brought into disaster areas a lot is they can kind of be the first communication as the grid starts to pick back up. And so I just mentioned kind of three or four different types of radio just in that, in that quick little synopsis. So having a handy talkie in your kit, uh, of course, being an amateur is preferred here because then you can practice with it, right? Going back to, hey, you talk to your friends every day. Well, what does that make you? It makes you more comfortable on the radio. In an emergency, you won't have to pull up the manual and go, how do I, what's the frequency again? What, where am I supposed to be talking on this? You, you have the skill to operate with it when, you know, it's a high stress situation during an emergency, right? Right. Yeah. There, there's that idea. We don't, uh, we don't rise to the occasion. We fall to our level of training. And so to me, that's, that's it exactly is like, 
the reason to get the license is not because in an emergency you need a license. It's because in an emergency you want to have practiced already. You want to be comfortable enough that the learning curve of the mechanics of operating an emergency is, is already done with. Now you just have the emergency to deal with. Exactly. And, and you want to give yourself the best chance possible of getting the help or helping others that you can. And really, the best part about this is good news. This is a whole lot of fun while you're doing it. It's not like a painful thing that you have to experience um, or that it's a very difficult test. It's not at all to get started. And I bet you, you know, if you're kind of of a, a technical mind or curious, uh, just curious about how things work, kind of learning, you know, scratching the surface on how radio frequencies work, what they do, how radios work. When you start looking at that, it's, it's fascinating. And it, and it starts to just drive itself as you look at it. You're like, oh man, this is, you just kind of want to go to the next thing and learn more about it. Yeah. Are there historical examples of people, uh, of, of uh, hams operating in emergencies and sort of what did that look like? Yeah, there, there's a couple different examples. Well, I, I, did a, I did a couple different shows on this, but the, the ones that leap to mind, there's generally two things that, that can occur. One, someone kind of hurts themselves, like they're hiking, or uh, they hurt themselves in an area where there is no cell phone. And they'll either have an amateur radio operator kind of in their group, or there will be an amateur radio person that stumbles upon them, or somehow they'll get an amateur involved. And, and that amateur will end up pulling out the radio, calling out to the repeater, like the repeaters we mentioned earlier, and saying, hey, I need, I need help. Uh, I've got somebody... You know, they got stung by a bee. They're going into shock. They're allergic to bees. And that person on the repeater that, that takes that call can then take their cell phone or, you know, whatever and call the first responders and help get them to that location, right? There's multiple different examples of that. Two that come to mind, there was uh, one in Catalina Island where somebody had fallen and that person, uh, a couple, kind of went to where this person had fell and ended up getting help that way. There was another one in the UK where a young girl went into, uh, had a seizure, I believe, and they ended up getting uh, help again through calling for help, hitting a repeater and, and getting the first responders to them. The flip side of that, and, and there's a bunch of examples of that, but the flip side of that is where you actually have people that will deploy these are usually part of these emergency groups. I'll, we'll probably talk about them in a little bit later, but ARIES is one of them. RACES is another one. And there's different um, acronyms that go along with that. Those people usually are teams that are equipped with specific radios and, and specific capabilities. And they'll take them to like islands that have been pretty much devastated as far as their grid's concerned after hurricanes. The hams there often the people that live there and the people that come to there with equipment will likely be the first ones to get repeaters back on the air. They, with their capabilities and what they know in radio, they were able to bring repeaters back online, bring communication back, get communication into hospitals so that they were able to, you know, handle the emergency medical care in those situations. One of the things that, so Chase has always been into preparedness and ever since we were in, you know, roommates together. And I think I, I would always kind of wonder what, you know, what's, what's going to happen to you? Like, why, why are you so, you know, invested in being so prepared for everything? And I think one of the things I've, I've learned from talking to him, and I think just from your stories, you just mentioned a, a big part of it is about helping others and being able to, you know, if you, with the amount of people you're around, it's probably more likely that you're going to run into somebody else having a problem than you are just by you know numbers just you know uh, sure. um so i think it's interesting to think about what is like the overhead if for somebody who would want to learn this of time so what would it take how much time and effort and what type of person do you think would benefit the most based on their environment where they live um what they yeah i guess that's the only kind of qualifier i can think of but these are all really good questions. I feel like there's a much larger answer and we could go really deep with them. Uh, generally, it's not that expensive to get your license. You don't need to buy a radio to get your license, by the way. A website comes to mind. It's the one I recommend everybody go to, hamstudy.org. Um, they have a 
online kind of courses you can take and there's online testings. There are sample tests so you can kind of practice before you go take the test. It's all free, by the way. That's the best part about their website is it's free. And then if you decide you want to get your license, a big thing that's happened, it's kind of a positive, I guess you can look at it from COVID-19. Before, how you get your license is you'd have to find a, like a local club. You'd have to physically go to that club and you'd have to take the test. And then you'd have to wait for that club to put it in an envelope, ship it off to the FCC, and then they'd update the database and boom, you got your call sign. Now, we are testing online, actually via Zoom. Uh, so we take the volunteer examiners, we get them in a Zoom call, and we watch the, the participant, the person taking the test, and they... We had something fall over in my garage right now. Sorry about that. Uh, then we, uh, they take the test and we kind of use the online, you know, the webcam and whatnot to run them through the process. And so you can get your technician, general, and extra class all online now. And the only thing you have to pay, if not free, a lot of places are completely free. So right now this costs you nothing, um, is at most like $15. And that's just kind of a administrative cost. Now, as far as radios are concerned, Getting into radio has kind of never been cheaper, but it's also never been more expensive at the same time. And I'll kind of break that down a bit. About 2015, we got introduced to Chinese radios. A lot of uh, Chinese radios started hitting the market. They're called Baofangs, right? Everybody's probably, well, if you're familiar with radio, you might have heard of the term Baofeng. But there are others along those lines too. And, and what they are is, is very inexpensive uh, radios. And they kind of have become the entry drug to amateur radio because for like as little as 25 to $30, you can have one of these radios and you can start, again, before you have your license, don't transmit, that would be illegal. But before you have your license, you can use that radio to listen to what's out there. And there's a lot out there. It's, it's more than just kind of uh, the amateur radio spaces, but even in the amateur radio spaces, there's, there's so much going on often. Depending on where you live, it can vary. And then from that point, it, it does start to get more expensive, particularly as you get into HF. And what can sometimes make things really expensive is, the, the and it's a good thing, because amateur radio and, and amateur radio operators in general are so interested in not just enhancing their own radios or enhancing radio as kind of an art form and a hobby, they're also really, really good at adapting technology that already exists. And things have progressed from you know, vacuum tubes in the beginning all the way up to software-defined radios now. And some of these whiz-bang software-defined radios can do so much because often they have basically a computer embedded in them. And we have the capability now to have really, really cool stations. Sometimes they're very expensive, but we have more capability kind of than we ever had with radio. And it's it's really, I say, a great time to be alive in radio because of the options we have, starting at the very inexpensive and then going all the way up to the, to the more expensive. How about from a time commitment standpoint, you know, from getting into it to getting your license and being able to transmit? So if you're, if you're pretty passionate about it and you spend, you know, 10 to 30 minutes a day um, on it, and that's, I think that might even be pushing it. I'd say within two weeks, you could go test for your license to get your technician license and, and you'd be good to go. And really then at that point, you're kind of always learning, I say, regardless of, of where you think you are. You, there's always something new you learn within, within radio. And from that point, then it's just, well, do you want to go to general or do you want to kind of stay in technician land and have some fun? Because there's so many things you can do there. There are uh, amateur radio satellites that can use you know, the radio that Chase was holding up. You can use that to talk um, to a satellite as it's passing overhead. It kind of acts like a repeater that's really, really high up. So you can technically talk to other states uh, via the radio. And you know that's nothing more than that Baofeng and getting your technician license really to kind of get into that and start exploring it. And if you want to improve your station and, and get better at operating those satellites, it'll, you know, just you can build your own antenna or you can possibly buy a better radio. Um, so it, it's pretty broad in that sense. It starts to really kind of open up. Are there any like legal exceptions um, for transmitting in, an, in the case of an emergency? There is. This question has come up a lot lately because I've been asked many, many times, hey, 
aren't we in a, a kind of a national emergency? Can I just use my radio? Uh, the answer is no. You, you have to be in pretty close to great bodily harm or someone is there and is in imminent chance of, of death. And then you can use the radio to call out on almost any frequency. This isn't just amateur radio related, but almost any frequency you can call out on. I, I would actually argue any frequency you can technically do, but there's, there's some kind of gray areas in that. I will say this though. If you have been putting off getting your amateur radio license because you've been thinking, I'll just use it in a time of emergency, then I would just fall back on what Chase said. You don't rise to the emergency. You fall back on what your level of competence is. And if you have not been using the radio, even as simply as talking to your buddies on your morning drive time, you will not be able to rise to the, the, the situation of whatever emergency is at hand. It, it's, it's, it is something you must practice, just like you have to practice first aid, just like you have to practice the myriad things that go into being personally prepared for you know whatever you're planning that could happen. Uh, it's just like that. It's in the same wheelhouse as that. It's a skill and you must kind of learn to be the best operator you can. Alex, did you have a, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off if you had uh, another one. Okay, so can we go through, uh, uh, I mean, again, my, my mind is on the preparedness track. Can we go through maybe a couple levels of like, if you're somebody who has never really considered a lot of these sort of aspects of being prepared for different types of emergencies before, let's go through sort of a couple levels of what you can do to have a, a plan and have some pieces of that plan in place so that, uh, you know, if something happens, you're prepared. So maybe at the smallest level, like what, what can you do just in terms of um, your local area, maybe your family, your neighbors, things like that? I, uh, I've got a couple, well, first, this really doesn't even start out with amateur radio. My, my recommendations don't, don't start there. Yeah. Uh, generally, I, I really recommend everybody has just a, a general coverage receiver, you know, an AM, FM broadcast radio. Uh, this one happens to do weather as well as shortwave and, and some other nifty features. You want to listen when, if something were to happen, you want to be able to gather as much information as you can. You kind of want to get a situation report of what's going on at the local level. And one of the best ways you can do that is just listen to the broadcast frequencies, AM, FM frequencies. If you have a scanner, right? Scanners don't require a license. A scanner that is capable of listening to, you know, not just police, but your first responders, even public works is a, is a good thing to have um, for understanding what's going on around you. But then going back to, you know, what we said about the Walmart blister pack FRS radios, if you find a couple of them that are cheap and of appreciable quality, you know, why not buy four or five? Uh, why not ask your neighbors to buy the same radio and say, hey, have a couple of these. Uh, let's break them out every four months, every six months, and we'll do a quick check just to keep our skills, you know, from getting completely dull. And now you've got kind of a, a local network of, of people. Hopefully these are like-minded people that kind of also want to be a little bit prepared for an emergency. So you've got kind of your communications at the, at the broadcast level, pulling in emergency broadcasts, you know, whatever from the government slash first responders and any news reports going on. Then you layer that with people, either your close family members, local community in your neighborhood, now you have kind of local coverage for people that might need help or you yourself might need help. You'll be able to communicate with them without relying on your cell phones, which even if the networks don't go down, almost all cell phones in the time of a, a proper disaster have become overloaded, overloaded to the point that uh, reliable communication becomes difficult with them. So it, it's not that much money to say, hey, I can have an AM FM transmitter or sorry, receiver and a couple of FRS radios and be like, Hey, okay, that that's something. The, the next level is, is where you kind of commit to going and getting your license and kind of going down that path of, of amateur radio. And really what that does is it, it opens up greater transmit power. 
FRS is like maybe one at most, I think uh, one and a half to two watts. Whereas, you know, a handy talkie for amateur radio is generally five watts or higher. And from there, you know, we have access to 50 watt radios, 100 watt radios, and then we have amplifiers where we can get, you know, big power out of an antenna. And then all of a sudden, you're not only just intercommunicating with your neighborhood, you're actually communicating on a wider level that you could be directing traffic in a net situation where you're taking in people that need help and finding the connection for them. You know, I give the example of you're in your neighborhood, somebody on their FRS radio calls you and says, you know, Mrs. Smith down the street, she's on an oxygen machine. Um, the power has gone. Does somebody have a generator? Well, nobody in the neighborhood has a generator that's available. What do we do? Well, you hop on the repeater that are oftentimes solar powered, has a battery backup, or just use your more powerful station and say, does anybody have a generator we can borrow for, you know, however long? Or maybe they have a generator, but they don't have gas. Who needs, who has extra gas? So all of a sudden, it's not just about like, I must get first aid medical attention to person A. It is, hey, we're going to be dealing with this for like a week. Uh, what do we need to make sure everybody stays okay for that amount of time? And it could be as simple as like, I need a generator, right? Or refrigeration, right? If they need penicillin, not penicillin. Um, insulin. Insulin. Yeah, that's an example. Yeah, I think about when Alex and I were in Boston in college, uh, and that was at the time of the the marathon bombing. And as we were we were out watching the marathon a couple of blocks away, and as soon as that happened, we both uh, I think I think Alex or I one of us had left our phones back at our dorm, and so we had one cell phone between the two of us to very quickly call our families and let them know something's happening. We're okay. We'll keep you updated. And I don't know if it was the cell phones getting overloaded. I don't know if it was um, police trying to shut down towers for fear of cell phone activated other explosive devices, whatever it was, for whatever reason, at some point shortly after things kicked off, people were not able to get calls out. So, right. and if that had been, you know, luckily that was not an extended period of time where, where people were not able to get calls out. But if that had been, that would be really hard even just from a, you know, keeping our, our families uh, in the loop perspective, that would be very hard to do with the infrastructure that is in place versus a zero infrastructure solution like radio um, wouldn't have been affected. Yeah. And again, going back to it, you're, you're depending on their network. You're depending yeah. on AT&T's network, Verizon, whomever. And it can be turned off, as you mentioned, by first responders, police, military can have that turned off. We can deny access to it ourselves by everybody trying to spam it as fast as possible with calling people, which which happens. I live in Southern California. Every time there's an earthquake, it, it dies on you. Um, there are multiple examples on why you could not have access to a cell phone. So if you just cut the middleman out of it, and you become solely responsible with the communication by having, you know, a radio this size in your in your backpack. Yeah, it's it's extra work, uh, right? You you have to take the test, you have to have the radio, and you have to have the wherewithal and the knowledge to use it. At the same time, I would argue that I'm not just doing it for this hypothetical situation. I'm doing it because it's a lot of fun. Yeah. There are plenty of aspects to it that. Um, are super, super interesting and, you know, relative to the things I already do. Like there is an aspect of amateur radio I do that is solely based on hiking to the top of mountains and then making contacts with people. And it's like Pokemon for mountains, we call it. It's nice. Pokemon go to the top of a mountain and, and make radio contacts. Um, and that's a the super passion kind of thing for me is that's HF radio as well as the handy talkies and, it it's, gets you outdoors, you have a lot of fun with it, and you still get to kind of flex that muscle because you're basically operating kind of an emergency station, but on a mountain. So you have to be solely 100% self-reliant when you go out in the field and do that. And you got to have your kit pretty squared away to do it as well. Yeah. I live in uh, Fort Lauderdale in Florida. And with the, the 
kind of culture in my age group down here. I'm, I'm trying to imagine myself going over to the neighbors in my apartment complex and trying to hand them a radio. You guys need to have this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would argue that you would already have to know these people before you just start handing out radios. But hey, you know, Halloween's coming up. <laughs> Trick or treat, here's a radio. True. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was thinking uh, similarly along the lines of like my network. So I'm in New York City. And, uh, you know, in, in terms of radio, just the mechanics of radio wave propagation in the city, uh, there, there are obviously differences, you know, HF, uh, maybe it, you could achieve it, I'm sure, at some point, if you, you know, maybe you'd put an antenna on top of a building. But if I'm walking around at street level, uh, I'm basically stuck with VHF, UHF, and sort of what my plan should be in terms of like my network, my friends who might be, you know, over in Brooklyn or Queens or the, a different part of Manhattan um, or New Jersey, uh, you know, trying to put that together that's been an interesting challenge. It's very, it's very difficult. I, I've tried to work with some people that, that live in New York as well. And depending on how surrounded you are by the large buildings in that area, not even a large building, just a lot of buildings, mm -hmm. makes it difficult sometimes for the signals to get to where you're going. Yep. The best thing you can do often is try to get up on the top um, and get an antenna up there and and that will do better for you but those are those are serious um difficulties that exist in in that particular environment yeah uh, i've been able to listen to a, a lot of repeaters around here but like i said i, ha I haven't tried transmitting so at some point i'm going to be you know taking uh, somewhat diligent notes on so what repeaters i can actually hit um and you know how good a contact I can make and where. So I, I've always going back to the, the mic fright thing really quick, and then I'll let you go to the next one. Sure. If you, if you guys it under like starting your first contact, if you guys it under saying, you know, give your call sign, just wanted to check and make sure I'm repeating the, uh, hitting the repeater. How do I sound? Because then it's really more about your, the technical capability of your radio. It's not right. about you talking uh, your skill in talking it's hey let's talk about this radio is it good is it bad how do i sound right and then that moves into an easy discussion a first break the ice kind of conversation so that's what i always recommend people start with yeah yeah that makes sense so i want to go one level up in the preparedness uh sort of chain here um let's talk about some of those organizations that you mentioned sort of aries races what are those? What does that space look like? And how do you start to get involved in more organized systems of uh, emergency comms? So the big one that I generally recommend is uh, the ARRL, which is the American Radio Relay League, is kind of like the United States membership service that kind of looks out and protects uh, amateur radio. They're kind of like our, our lobbying body. They try to make sure that, because again, the, the frequencies that we're all trying to share the same frequencies, businesses, the military, governments, amateur radio, there is no more frequencies to hand out. The DC to daylight space of radio is finite and the FCC manages who can talk on what. And so the ARRL kind of helps out in, in lobbying for, for things like that. But also they have a huge community outreach system. Uh, for their for many different things, but one of the things they do is Aries, which is Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and I kind of hinted at that when I was talking about individuals that have gone into like hurricane or disaster areas with with radio equipment. They have local groups that are usually based off of your ARRL division, and they take members generally amateur radio operators themselves and they do drills for kind of similar to what we've been talking about certain situations where you'd have to transfer information back and forth like what's needed here um, we have somebody hurt over here they often support things like foot races foot races are, are a big deal um, for radio in fact, uh, the Boston Marathon still uses amateur radio as, as one of the methods that they use for, for brokering information back and forth, particularly for the runners who are EMS um, specialists. They will have a radio operator tethered with them, and they'll stay in constant communication with the, with the kind of radio HQ area or the incidents commander. 
but specifically these teams are built around the concept of preparing for emergency situations that can happen. They can meet monthly or, you know, bi-monthly and they will again, go for races, support them, different sporting events, as well as these, these mock examples. There's another one called races and it's literally spelled races basically. And I believe that is the department of Homeland security. It's kind of a hard one to Google because if you search for races, you get actual races. Um, right. So you have to add like DHS into it. But uh, I always recommend people check out uh, ARRL's Aries because there's usually a division in your area or there's some kind of activity that you can get involved, uh, much like you can with CERT, uh, which is the local community emergency response team we mentioned earlier. And some CERT teams will also have kind of a radio adjunct to it that you can get involved with. Some do, some don't. Um, the sheriff's department, they often sometimes have a radio emergency team as well that is usually a volunteer-based system that is has civilians in it as well, depending on you know the different aspects of things they're doing. And usually it's an emergency response team as well. So it's really gonna depend on your area and what's active in your area. Cool. Yeah, the uh, New York CERT uh, application just says, are you a licensed amateur? And I'm sure that they've got roles for um, Pam's uh, mm -hmm. haven't started diving into that too much yet, but I'll get there. Um, cool. So I want to, in the interest of time and the audience and all of this, I want to transition to our next section, but first I want to make sure, um, Alex, do you have any other questions that you wanted to, to hit before we move on? No, I think I'm all good. I think I got the, uh, the pitch. <laughs> cool. Uh, Josh, are there any other uh, points that you feel we should hit in terms of amateur radio or any of the topics that we've been hitting um, that you feel like we just want to uh, get to before we move on? I, I would go back and to one question I, I don't think I answered, which um, Alex, I think, asked is kind of who is the person that might be interested in amateur radio? I think we, we hit the emergency preparedness type for sure. Mm -hmm. And I definitely talked about uh, those that kind of, I don't want to say are, are looking for a community to join, but are interested in, in other avenues of communicating with people. I know that's not really a thing people think about. It's like, Hey, I can just hop on Facebook now. Um, but at the same time, the, the other group that I think is uh, really goes kind of hand in hand with radio, particularly whatever project you're working on, is the maker community, the, the hacker community, that kind of stuff. Um, very, there's the Venn diagram, a lot of overlap on that. The maker community alone, there's just a massive maker aspect to amateur radio, making your own antennas, making your own radios. And then oftentimes they have parallels in, in other things where your, your mission, for example, is let's say you're a drone operator. Well, you can get your amateur radio operator uh, license and then you can use your amateur radio to communicate with your drone. The, the different bands of operation for the transmitter that you use for your drone, you can make some of them, uh, not all of them, work with amateur radio. So you can kind of leverage the two together. Um, there's a myriad other examples like um, amateur radio positioning systems that we use. Uh, those are little kits you can buy and, and people use those to, you know, put a beacon on their, on their pet to make sure that they find their pet at the end of the day. And these are little home brewed things that they can build. You can build at home. So maker community, hacker community is a, a big uh, aspect of amateur radio as well. Cool. Yeah, actually that, that's a, well, I'll, we'll talk about it potentially later. I have a, I just had got a raspberry Pi. I want to, I have ideas for what to do okay. with it, but there's so many projects for amateur yeah. radio. It's really cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, Cool. So quick note to anybody that's here watching, we've got a couple of people in Zoom. If you do have questions for Josh or for me and Alex on this topic, on whatever topics that you want related to this, feel free to pop them in the chat. We will um, sort of call on you. You get to unmute, ask the question yourself, or we can ask it for you if you want. So feel free to start typing some of those questions there. But first, we will move on to a segment that we like to call the off topic. 
For anybody that has not listened to The Switch before, The Off Topic is a segment where we ask our guests to bring up a topic that is not directly related to the main topic, although often it does circle back around. That's okay. Um, sometimes it's a hobby, a philosophical idea, something someone said to you in line at the grocery store. It really can be anything at all. We'll do maybe five, ten minutes on it at most. Uh, so, Josh, what do you have for us? Uh, I... I came up across this and it was more of an interesting curiosity to me. And it, it, hopefully it's not a too downer of a subject, but my wife um, is extremely not concerned, but, but very proactive in following what's kind of been going along with the statistics with COVID-19 cases of people getting COVID-19 and, and unfortunately passing away from COVID-19. And she relayed to me, um, I think it was yesterday that uh, we have, and this is who numbers, we have passed, um, as far as people passing away, deaths from COVID-19, we've passed malaria uh, in, this, in the world. And I was always taught that malaria is an absolute killer of people. It's, it's the mosquito is like the deadliest animal. And COVID-19, this kind of thing that, that hit us completely out of the blue, um, no vaccinations or anything like that. So I'm, I'm building to my curiosity, but I mentioned that I'm in Los Angeles County. I'm in the southeast portion of Los Angeles County. I'm basically the last city before you get to Orange County. I have friends that live in Orange County. I have lots of people that, that are there. And I found this kind of, I don't know what's causing it, but this trend of people that are no longer thinking about COVID-19. <laughs> and uh, in the OC, particularly, people not wearing masks. And being that I am kind of emergency-minded, my concern is kind of how did we get to this point? And I, I obviously know there's a lot going on politically now in the environment, but um, what is it about human nature that you start to get what they call like emergency fatigue? You just get to a certain point where what is being asked of you, you just start getting lackadaisical on it. Maybe I won't wash my hands as often as I did a week ago or, you know, make sure I wash my mask, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a, not so much philosophical, but a issue question I have with humanity is, is how do we get to this point? And maybe it's just because we get, we stop seeing people we know that, that get it, that we think, okay, we can, we can move on. It's no longer a problem. But then I see numbers like that my wife show me and, and I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond to that. I don't know how to get people to think, you know, critically about stuff like this or objectively at the data. Yeah. So just for me to chime in. So I mentioned I live in Fort Lauderdale and the basic sentiment here is that it's over. Like the beach is absolutely packed. Nobody's wearing a mask, people shoulder to shoulder at all the bars. And I mean, obviously, like you said, there's so many factors that go into people just deciding that, you know, they're just going to go out and you know, whatever. But I think the biggest thing I saw is personally is just like a social influence. Like they see one of their friends stop wearing the mask and then like, yeah, I don't need to be around that. And it's just like the slippery slope. Right. And then all of a sudden they're out at a restaurant and they're six feet apart, but then a friend comes up and now they're not six feet apart. And it just kind of, you know, I, from one of the, what I've seen, that's a, the biggest factor that kind of unravels people's um, you know, um, more logical thinking, I think. Yeah. I, I think emergency fatigue is a good, uh, a good term for it. I've, I haven't heard that before. From my experience in New York city, it depends, uh, depends on where in the city you are in my neighborhood up here. Um, uh, it's sort of been on and off at the beginning. It took a long time for people around here to start wearing masks and to, you know, to start seeing hand sanitizer everywhere in grocery stores. Um, and some of that's a supply issue, but uh, I think it was also a will issue that people didn't want to do that. Um, and then you saw it everywhere. And just in the past week or so, uh, you start seeing it taper off. Um, and that's really unfortunate because this this neighborhood of New York and New York in general. I mean, we're not out of the woods by any means. Um, but just last weekend, we went to walk down by the riverside 
obviously with our masks, expecting to social distance. And there are barbecues and birthday parties, people who have masks that are hanging off of their faces. And yeah, they're underneath the chin <laughs> job. Right. Yeah. Or just on the table next to them, like not not even trying. And it's it's an interesting psychological thing to see. Like I, I don't blame any of those people because it's clearly like it's it's no I don't see it as an individual person's sort of moral failure to be a part of that sort of uh, community consciousness of we're tired of going out with masks, right? That that's that's emotionally and intellectually fatiguing to try to figure out what you should be doing moment to moment in order to be uh, sort of the best you can be in terms of protecting yourself and your community, right? There is absolutely a fatigue aspect to that. But the idea that we can go out and have barbecues and birthday parties in the park with, you know, 50, 60 people gathered around with no masks, like, in my mind, just looking at the numbers, just looking at what's going on and how this this thing spreads, we're not at that point by any means. Uh, and it is absolutely a, an interesting psychological phenomenon that, that that's happening. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've, I know people who have, who've died from it. I know people who've caught it, and and they were in the hospital. They've thankfully recovered. And you know, a month before it all kicked off, my uh, my stepdad had a, a lung transplant, and a month before that, my father had a gallbladder removed. So I'm on like you know DEFCON nine when it's when it's about my family, uh, but I you know I I see you know as you mentioned the Facebook posts, the social media posts of, of people going out. And I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I don't want to be in my house anymore. I, I don't want to keep uh, doing this. But at the same time, you know, I, I, I look back to Memorial Day that was just about two weeks ago. And particularly here close by me, Huntington Beach, there was, you know, shoulder to shoulder people um, out protesting for at the time that protest was um, for you know, uh, the, the telling people to stay home. And I've noticed now, again, with my wife tracking these numbers, that the, it's starting to creep up again as far as new cases. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I guess we're all just trying to balance the influx of people that go to the hospital. So as long as that's happening, I, I guess we're achieving something. But uh, I do worry about people like my my two dads, I guess you could say my stepdad and my, my biological father. Uh, but you know, it's just an interesting human trait. And it is specifically, I was focusing on that emergency fatigue or, or Joseph, I see in the chat wrote uh, compassion fatigue, which I, I mm. hadn't seen that. And there's a Wikipedia article that I will look up after the fact here. So thank you for sharing that. Um, but I just find it an interesting kind of human trait. I think the other factor that I, I'll mention that I see from talking to people who are experience this, experiencing this a lot and just really don't care about the masks anymore is that the information that we're getting, it's hard to make sure that your source of information is one, giving you something credible, but two, giving you something you can understand what to do with. It's really, really hard when like last week, the WHO had this person who was speaking about something very specific about asymptomatic transmission when that term has been used for and there there's like there's a confusion between asymptomatic and presymptomatic and like some of this is scientific language sometimes the terms mean something different in the scientific community than the sort of at large public and just the fact that that is not being communicated clearly i think contributes a lot to this fatigue yeah, I I think that would be a part of it too. Um, I don't think, I think at the same time, it would be important to remember that, hey, a lot of this is happening for the first time, or sure. we're kind of going through this the first time. And, and, and I think, you know, obviously, when you look to the government, you think, oh, but you've got to have all the answers. Well, maybe not so fast. Uh, we're, we're, they're not, they're coming at this for the first time on a lot of this stuff. Um, and to me, maybe that falls back on you know, I hate to I hate to go back to the topic, but uh, why do why would I carry a radio? It's maybe I, I think about that just a little bit further on what could happen, or maybe due to my experiences growing up in Southern California with the earthquakes and losing power 
losing uh, gas, natural gas, all that stuff, uh, that there's kind of like an extra level of caution, I guess. Um, so if I think there's something bad, you know, this big band unknown wolf of, a, of COVID-19, for example, that I'm, I'm not really that, I don't care as much what who says. I kind of get the idea it's bad. And so I'm just going to say, okay, mass all the time, regardless of what you're doing, mass all the time, and then keep that extra layer. But it's the, the, the shirking of the mass and the complete 180 that seems to have happened that I'm specifically focusing on is like, wow, that is, uh, that is an interesting see thing to see kind of firsthand. Yeah, I also see just a lot of, you know, confirmation bias too with one, you know, screenshot of a news story to get shared, like you mentioned, Blair, or Chase mentioned with that, you know, WHO question like a week ago, like, oh, masks are ineffective, shared, shared, that's what I thought, you know, and it just becomes like common knowledge among, you know, insulated groups, you know, and, and it's just, it's it's hard to you know, like you said, it's hard to, to fully know what to believe or think or how to, when to be aware that you may be in an echo chamber, which I know Chase and I talk a lot about and the whole podcast of idea of the switch of assuming that there's something incorrect that you believe or a better way to perceive things or, or learn about things. So that's a good, good off topic. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was good. All right. You ready to move on to questions? Oh, I love questions. That's like my favorite thing. All right. So the first question is from Charles Stacey Harris III, uh, who uh, I'm smiling because that's my dad and I, I don't call him by his name. Uh, Charles, do you want to ask your question? Oh, I got to unmute you. Thank you for unmuting me. Yeah, so uh, it was just a silly question of, uh, have you ever talked to the International Space Station? And if so, was it the coolest thing ever? That is a fantastic question. The answer is no, but I will go into a little bit of depth there. Uh, part of the reason is the there's a group called ARIS. It is Amateur Radio International Space Station or, or something along those lines. And it's a group of amateurs that goes to different schools. Um, and there's different groups and they go to different schools around the country. And they're, you know, public schools, I, I believe it's um, middle school through high school. Sometimes they do elementary, but I'm not sure. Go to their website, search ARIS, uh, and you can, you can find out more. But most of the contacts that they organize with the ISS, they try to line up with those ARIS events. So they can get kids talking to um, the astronauts, which I think is fantastic. There are rarer situations where the astronaut will stay on after the ARIS contact and uh, work with, with amateurs that are listening. Rarer still, and this is much rarer than it used to be, uh, where they will just get on the air and, and communicate with people. You have to be monitoring their frequencies a lot, and you have to have kind of an antenna system that kind of tracks the ISS, or you're going outside with an antenna and you're, you're waving it around, freaking your neighbors out on what's that guy talking to. Um, because literally the pass is about nine minutes. So if you didn't hear them, whoop, next nine minutes. The plus side of this is they have a repeater system on board the ISS for APRS, which is the automatic uh, positioning radio system. And what that allows you to do is you can take your radio outside. I don't have my radio that does it in front of me, but you can send a packet of data. It sounds like a burst, like a fax tone um, up to the, the satellite, the ISS, and it will take that and then downlink it. And so you will actually be brokering communication via the ISS through its APRS uh, digipeter, which is really cool. So you can have like a two-party conversation, two people on the ground that you're doing through the, uh, the ISS, which is pretty fun. Nice. The next question is from Sean Coffey. Sean. I was wondering uh, how you could use, or what the, how you could compare uh, ham radios with satellite radios in an emergency situation. What are the benefits of one and, and what are the negatives of the other? 
and how they compare. Thanks. Great question. A lot of people, particularly those that go outdoors, um, out here we have the PCT trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, which is like the three month quit your job, go from the border of Mexico all the way up to Canada. A lot of people there carry the satellite help me transponders. Those are great because they go straight to a satellite and then you can get the help you need. Um, most of the time they don't have any issue. They're good. Um, the only question you have is how much do you trust that service? If it's just you that's calling for help and it's not you know, saturated with people calling for help, then fine, it's a great system. Ham radio, if you're down in the middle of a valley surrounded by mountains all around you, not gonna work that great if you need help. That's, spoiler alert, that's probably not gonna be the best thing. You're gonna have to find somebody to help you that's a bit local or, or they can relay your comms uh, up and out if you're in that type of situation. However, you do need help, you can go up on the mountaintop and, or a hill and you can make a longer contact to like a repeater or something like that to get help. Uh, ham radio is generally 100% terrestrial when it comes to the VHF, UHF radios we talked about. So I would argue for both of them, to be honest. Uh, the satellite transponders are going to help for you getting help or maybe someone getting help. That's not going to be a cheap affair, um, you know, that whole thing. And plus, that's usually a service that you have to pay for. In some cases, it can be more reliable than amateur radio. If you were more in a suburban situation where you needed help, you know, that may not be the time to, to use the satellite system. It's going to depend on the situation. But there's definitely situations where satellite is going to be better than amateur radio in certain cases. Awesome. Uh, next up is Ed. Ed, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Let's see. There you go. Yeah. Uh about 40 years ago, there was a huge craze for CB radios, and I and most of my friends were very actively involved. We drive around and we communicating with many different types of people. We had a community with truckers, and this is all the way from Syracuse, New York, to Queens, and uh, it was really incredible. And we uh, monitored many uh, difficult situations. In fact, I was once uh, rescued. I was in a snowbank in uh, uh, Quebec, and I was able to use my CB radio, and a farmer came and uh, got me out of the ditch. And I don't know what I would have done without the, uh, the CB. It, it was an incredible phenomenon, but it just sort of uh, disappeared uh, in by the 90s and it was no longer a factor but I never saw such a level of uh, of uh, community involvement and I really I really loved my activities with the CB group CB is fantastic it hasn't gone anywhere by the way you can still get a CB radio and, and you can still do that um, I would just put it more towards the the FRS radio GMRS radio type um, situation. It's a channelized radio system. So you're all on the same channels with, with all the other people that have CBs. Oftentimes that's not a problem. There's, there's plenty of space to go around. Uh, the other thing, we didn't really get into it because it's a, it's a pretty technical discussion. Uh, our sun goes through 11 year cycles. And undoubtedly when you had that contact from Syracuse, where was the other side of the contact Syracuse to, did you say upstate New York or? It's all right, he's muted again. Oh, okay. Let's go ahead, Ed. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Queens, New York, all the way, to about 250 miles. Ah, okay, that was what I needed, I needed the miles. So the, uh, the CB operates on affectionately the 11 meter band um, that's what it's called anyway. And that, to, to be able to have long distance comms on that frequency set usually requires to be at the high side of the 11 year sun cycle. Um, that's when you get those really long contacts that people get with CB. We're on the other side of that cycle. We're on the bottom end of that cycle. So CB is less popular than it, than it normally is. Five years from now, 
uh, people are going to start getting back on CB and, and the other bands of amateur radio will be will be really popular again, like 10 meters that was mentioned earlier. It's a bit different on what causes that. That's a yearly phenomenon con called sporadic E. Uh, but amateur radio, the advantage of amateur radio is it's sun cycle proof. We can just hop to lower bands uh, down the frequency space and we can pick back up that long distance comm. So I'm generally operating on seven megahertz through and then the other band I operate is on 14 megahertz whereas uh, CB I believe is down in um, 29 megahertz I believe and so that's that's kind of that separation will change the antenna I'm using and give me a bit longer throw with my signals but good point CB is still completely valid uh, people just may want to get into where you have a little bit more privileges all right, next up we have Vanessa. Um, hi. Um, I really know nothing about this subject, but I'm very interested, so I'm sorry if my question is a little one I should already know. Um, is your location traceable, and is there any record of your conversations? Good question. So I, I, would, I would say just consider yes. Uh, but your cell phone signal is traceable, right? And so is all the information that we give out to Google and however else. But let me be more specific. If uh, for some reason you were to just be having a, a good chat with your friends on a repeater and you're holding that thing down for, I don't know, give or take two minutes. If someone was really dead set on finding your location, uh, they could do what's called radio triangulation. And, and all radios suffer from this. So, you know, take this for what it's worth. Uh, but yeah, I, I have an antenna that would allow me to basically find where the highest intensity point is. And then I kind of just aim in that line, take a bearing, uh, run that bearing across a map as a straight line. And then I can do this or someone else can do this at the same time. Walk over quarter mile do the same thing take the bearing from this direction and once we get two bearings of crossing lines well that's that's the triangle that's where the triangulation comes from so once those two lines intersect i get a pretty good idea where you are and if you continue to transmit uh, then i can get closer and closer until yeah i'm i'm basically right there and that's a good question that i didn't really answer before is kind of how does amateur radio self-police and how do we maintain this decorum as well because we can all triangulate each other. Um, it's not difficult to do this once you learn about these techniques. It's very simple. In fact, there's sporting events that are based off of direction finding. And uh, it's, it's really popular. It's basically like a foot race where you have radios and you run from transmitter to transmitter and try to be the first one to find all the transmitters in a, in a given event. Uh, fantastic fun. But yeah, if, if you continue to transmit on one frequency, then... Yes, people can find you. That's why we use, that's why we try and follow the guidelines, the FCC guidelines of using your call sign at the appropriate times. You know, try to maintain a certain level of decorum and that whole thing that goes along with it. I think that was your question. Was there another part to that? Can they direction find you? Oh, and is it recorded? Uh, yeah, okay. So repeaters nowadays are internet enabled. Uh, many of them are. And so if not, um, what that allows is even though most of this is RF in the chain, there will be, you know, your radio to that repeater. And then that repeater may get on the internet and connect with other repeaters. And so then you have all these repeaters connected together and all talking. Well, when you do that, people get really interested in listening. And either that repeater system or the people that can receive that repeater will open up what's called like a Broadcastify, Broadcastify.com. They will make a radio station devoted to specific repeaters because they're interesting or they have a lot of activity. And that can be recorded and that can be on the internet. Um, as far as just recording things that you hear, m a lot of my radios have the capability to record. So yeah, I could do that if I wanted to. All right, next up is Dave Alpha Charlie Zero Romeo Victor. You are unmutable now. Okay, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, good evening, Josh. I'm a, a failure. I'm not a failure. I'm, I was reading the chat line, but I am a fi big 
fan of your show. Appreciate all the uh, emergency preparedness stuff. Now, I don't know if it was you or if it was one of your other competitors. Uh, what kind of mounts do you uh, use for your mobile uh, setup? What kind of mount? Yeah. You, uh, I don't know if you mentioned the mount of one of the, radio, one of the radios you had in your, vehicle, one of your vehicles. Yes, I, I used two. Uh, they're both from the Diamond brand, though. Diamond makes a mounting system that also has coax, coax attached to it. I generally recommend that. I'm scrolling through um, some slides that I did on a, t on, a, on a show not too long ago. I did a live stream called Mobile VHF, UHF, and HF Setups, mobile implying putting HF into a vehicle. And I'm looking for what it is. Uh, the K400C. The K400C is, by diamond, is what I use right now on my uh, screwdriver antenna. I'm, I know I'm getting into a little detail here, but that antenna allows me to do HF radio from my car, and that supports 6 meters through 40 meters. Diamond also makes a very similar mount. It's a little bit smaller and thus cheaper. And that's what I use for my VHF, UHF radio. Uh, that model number, I don't know. But if you can look up the K400C, C as in Charlie, uh, you'll be able to find the other one, I imagine. And, and Diamond's pretty highly regarded. I've been using those mounts for over a decade now. And they've been really satisfactory. Awesome. Next question is from Joseph Bullock. Oh, let's try that again. Nope. Thanks, guys, and uh, thank you for hosting, and thank you for joining us, uh, Josh. Um, I just have a question. Is there one habit that maybe you mentioned a fear of failure in the beginning? Is there one habit that you would point to that would help you, that has helped you getting past your either perfectionism or your fear of failure? Like the better to, uh, better is the enemy of good, you know, I'm remember that comment that you had made. So, you know, sort of one yeah. thing that maybe. I think it, I don't know that it was habit. I, I'm sure that, you know, let me, let me just say, the more you do that, the more it would build those connections in your brain that you should be doing that and incentivize you to continue doing that. But at the same time, um, more or less, why I did it was I, I really didn't have a lot of other options. Um, I value my time and I'm usually a very busy person working full time and I couldn't really take the time to stay home one day to have somebody come to my house, a professional and, and have them work on something. So I thought to myself, well, instead of just having one person come for four hours and knock the project out, I'm fine doing an hour every night over the course of a week and, and solve my problem. Now I'm not talking about like a mainline sewer stoppage or anything like that, but you know, small things like I, I would kind of line myself up to do a project and I would just keep reminding myself, Hey, it's still cheaper for me to do this, even buying all these cool tools than it is to pay a professional to come out and do it. Now I appreciate that the quality of the work that I do is not nearly up to the professional level, particularly when I started out doing it. But at the same time, I wouldn't let that stop me. I don't know if it was one particular habit. Um, maybe it's a, a tool collecting uh, problem that I have that, that may have <laughs> led me down that road. I, I don't know. But um, I, maybe it's just because I was on my own and kind of had to just learn to do it on my own and kind of turned into that skid a bit. I wish I had a better answer for that, to be honest. So I have two last questions for you that came up during this Q and A and then we will wrap up uh, one. What's the most interesting contact you've ever made? Um, probably New Zealand um, on voice. That was, that was fun. Um, where was another one? Airplane mobile. That was another good one. Pilots have HF radios uh, in the cockpit. And so I was able to communicate with a, a pilot that was operating over Colorado, I think. So we had a, we had a conversation there. He was very busy. Uh, once you, 
hams once they hear airplane mobile they just all these hams start getting on the band and you can you can hear them going crazy uh i did oh you know what it was actually when i went to go out and talk to mike lover um when they had me out i it happened to be a contest weekend we didn't go into a lot of detail on contests but it's kind of a radio sport thing um, usually it's the, over the course of a weekend, people try to make as many contacts as they can. And there's a ranking system. People get awards. It's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I happened to be in a hotel room. I had my five watt, what they call QRP. Uh, that's a Q code for low power. Q codes are little abbreviations we use when we're doing Morse code. And uh, I had this tiny little antenna. I'm sorry, little radio with a tiny antenna and I was in a hotel room. And for the heck of it, I set it up. I didn't really know. I didn't think I would get anybody. It's this dinky little vertical antenna. Uh, the radio puts out 10 watts of power at most, which is a paltry sum. And it was during the contest weekend and I'm listening. It, you'll listen fine. You'll hear a lot of stuff, but it's the, it's the transmitting that becomes difficult. And I'm listening for frequency, you know, people talking, and I hear this JA call. So I'm KI, Kilo India 6, this, this uh, Juliet Alpha call starts coming out. And if you're familiar with amateur radio call signs, that's Japan. And I'm like, oh, the Jap a Japanese call, uh, call sign. And it was this worldwide DX contest, which is long distance contacts contest. And um, I was like, what the heck? I was having breakfast. I I'll call them. And not the first time, not the second time, but the third time they heard me and they called me back and we were able to complete a QSO. And so that was, and QSO is a ham radio speak for contact, fancy, fancy terms. And so it was from Prescott, Arizona to Japan um, on 10 watts of power output, which is really mind boggling to me. Uh, so that's still probably my, I was most excited when I completed that contact. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, okay. So then my other question is, uh, I guess more technical in nature. Um, are there man portable HF rigs? Like, could you have an HF system that you can walk with while you're using it? Yes. I mean, I've seen HF rigs where like somebody will set it up on a park bench Right. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, you can literally be on the move while it's on your back while you're using it. Yes, it's it's called man pack portable radios. Okay. Uh, so almost any radio can be a man pack portable radio. It really just depends on how much power output you're putting out and how close you want to be to that power output because um, radio frequency is is an electromagnetic wave and it it can can give you a, a surface burn. It's not ion. It's it's you know non-ionizing radiation, so it's not going to cause cancer. But if you get too close to it, if you're putting out enough power, you can get a bit of a burn. Um, with that said, most of the man pack portable stuff is like five watts output. Again, talking about the radio that I used to talk to Japan, about five watts, maybe ten watts. You can absolutely do that. They make vertical antennas that you know shoot up however many feet into the air. The problem is is that you're you you generally have to have a radial what they call a radial and that's usually a wire that you drag behind you as you're hiking along the trail mm -hmm. that can work okay in certain situations where i live there's too much bushes and everything else to get caught up in the in the in this wire that you're dragging so that makes man pack portable possible um, i've seen it's very it's very easy to do if you're on like a beach because the salt water and the, the salinity of the water gives you really good counterpoise to to making uh, contacts with your antenna but i guess the important thing and this this can kind of get into some detail why do you have to drag a wire behind you well hopefully you're all familiar with what coax wire looks like coax wire has like a center pin connector right and then there's like a collar and that collar is usually um, sitting on top of a braided wire that goes around that center connector and it's separated by insulation well, those are the two parts of an antenna, right? There's the side that is your kind of your transmitting side, your center pin, and then there's the return side, which is the other portion. And, and that's generally the simplest antennas, just two wires, the center pin out of the coax and the shield out of the coax. We call that a dipole antenna. 
Well, a vertical is just taking that dipole, the positive side and the negative side, and then standing it up. And the positive side becomes the vertical radiating element that you're familiar as like a, a whip on an antenna, like the handy talkie here. And that negative side needs to have connection to the ground or be close to the ground. And that's called your, your radial or in some cases your counterpoise. And that's the part of the radio when you're doing vertical antennas that needs to drag behind you or be connected. Now there, there's another antenna called a loop, a loop antenna, but that is literally a big like hula hoop size thing that you know, you don't really want that by your head as you're transmitting. Um, particularly man pack portable. But if you look up man pack portable, you'll find a, a pretty interesting history. They would use uh, Alice packs, vintage uh, military surplus Alice pack frames, and they would mount radios kind of on their chest with the screens voice facing up to them so they could twiddle the knobs and all that stuff. I don't do that so much. I put the, back, I put the radio in my backpack. I hike to a really scenic spot. I sit down, make myself some coffee, and play radio <laughs> just, just in, that, in that situation. Cool. Okay. Well, that's going to be my new project. Uh, I, I, I like rucking a lot, so I'll put weight in the backpack and just hike and walk. I would love to, like you said, play radio while getting some exercise in. So that's going to be one of my projects uh, down the road here. All right, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the Switch podcast. Really appreciate this. If people are interested in following up with you, I know we keep mentioning the YouTube channel. I only said the name of it one time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where can people find you? Own. Yeah, it's my own account. I'm totally spaced on mentioning it. Really good job. Uh, it's, it's the Ham Radio Crash Course on YouTube. So uh, I have the YouTube show. I have a podcast that I do with my wife. Uh, she is not licensed. And so that is so much fun because she just asks a lot of questions, but more often than not, just kind of makes fun of me uh, in, a, in a nice way on, on this kind of radio hobby thing as I'm walking her through it. She's trying to get her license. We have a Facebook group. It's also called the Ham Radio Crash Course. We have a very, very active Discord, which is awesome because it tends a little bit younger. The community is a little bit younger and they're very, very active. And then I'm, you know, all over Instagram. I've even been doing some TikTok videos on ham radio. I don't know how that's really possible, but Again, my wife kind of helps me out on that stuff. Um, but yeah, YouTube, Ham Radio Crash Course will kind of get you to all those things if you're interested in kind of uh, not just learning about it, but trying to find a community of people that are very in tune with helping each other. My big push has been to create a, an inclusive environment for people to learn more about radio and that you know, going along with the, it's okay to fail. It's okay to ask dumb questions. You think they're dumb, but they're often not dumb. Um, you're probably just asking a question that other people have asked, or some people have just been too afraid to ask. So we try to make an environment where it's completely okay to, to raise those questions. And we try and work with everybody. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Josh. Any final thoughts, Alex or Josh, as we wrap up here? I'm just going back to that DDoS thing. I don't know if anybody followed that at all. Did anybody, was anybody impacted by that? We lost the ability to make phone calls today. That denial of service attack that took out a bunch of service providers. It literally yeah. happened like an hour or two before we got on this podcast. So I was, uh, I was like, Oh, there's a, there's a topic. There's a thing to talk about. Interesting. I'll have to look it up. All right. Yeah, check it out. Alex. No, I, I, I didn't, I didn't hear about that. I didn't, I wasn't affected to my knowledge. Cool. All right. Well, we will wrap it up here and hand it back to Shrikant for uh, the rest of the meetup. Josh, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much.